Hi, hi, church. How are you doing tonight? Doing good? That time of worship was really heartfelt and really needed. And I just want to say that I admire the leadership. I hope Nate Fetty, my brother from another mother, doesn't mind telling you this, but I was blessed by his prayer. They had a lot of technical difficulties, but they rode through it. And he said, don't forget to worship. And I love that reminder as we all come together in his name. And boy, was that worship felt where I encountered God. And so I'm grateful. I'm so happy to be here tonight. And if you're visiting here or with us for the first time, aloha and welcome. We've been committing these midweek moments to our devotions. And we have free ones in the back there for you if you don't have one. So please take advantage of that. Go get it. Uh, we've been traveling through the word, through scripture. Last week, we just finished the book of 2 Corinthians, and this week we started the book of Matthew. And so tonight, we're going to take a look at both of those books and a few scripture passages in there for what I believe God would have us know tonight. The book of Matthew is strategically placed, many scholars believe, in the middle of the Bible. If you start from the beginning, from Genesis, and you walk through the entire book, Matthew would actually be the 40th book. But it ushers in a very different way of God relating to his people. It's the first book of the New Testament. And in this book, they say that they're not sure if it was Matthew or Mark who wrote the book first. But what we do know is that Matthew was written about 55 years to 80 years after the events took place. And when he wrote it, some people believe that because he was of Jewish nature, of Jewish origin, that was his citizenship and his blood, because of that, he actually penned it in the Hebraic language. And then it was later translated to Greek. But what we do know about it is that scholars say that it's purposeful in its placement because it would be the first book that would usher in, again, a new way of God relating to his people. Matthew is a lot of, uh, I would say, overtones of having Jewish touches because he's predominantly writing to his fellow countrymen. And he wants them to know with evidence from what he's experienced that this Jesus is truly the one that they've been waiting for. He is the Messiah, the promised one that God would send to give them freedom, not only politically and on the landscape of human nature and human life, but spiritually. And so we see a lot of different teachings that Matthew records about how the kingdom principle of God contrasts and looks very different to what we've been taught by society. And then we have this curious shift in Matthew chapter 11, which is where we're going to camp tonight, where he is talking about the disciples of John the Baptist as they go away to report what Jesus has told them he is doing in his ministry. He starts to denounce these certain cities in his realm. And he says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, this city, this city, this city, this city, because the works that were done in you, if they were done in other places, they would have turned and they would have repented and they would have come close. Then there's this shift in Matthew chapter 11. And this is what it says in verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And tonight, I've titled this talk, The Perfect Fit. Because the goal tonight is that you and I would know as we leave this place that our lives have been perfectly and purposely fitted for the assignment that God has for us to do here on earth. So we're gonna delve into that a little bit, but before we do, can you pray with me? So Father, we thank you for that moment of worship. We thank you for that moment of surrender where we were still and we were reminded that you are God. 
And we thank you that where two or more are gathered, you are here. And so we worship you as our king, as our Lord, as our God. And we thank you that as you have collectively gathered us here tonight, that you have a word. So Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would open our minds and hearts to see Jesus. And in the revelation of who he is, that we will be changed more and more into your image. So we love you. We devote this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say, amen. amen. So like Pastor John was saying, it's been a whirlwind of a year. November is here, and it just seemed like yesterday that we were starting the new year in January. And a lot of things, as I look back over this year, it has just gone by like a whiz, like a flash. We, uh, Pastor John, Pastor Steph, uh, Pastor John Tilton, many of us were able to graduate this year in March, where we got, yeah, which is, we fought the good fight. <laughs> We kept the faith <laughs> and we crawled over that finish line. And it's, it's still kind of surreal to even think about that being an 18 month program and then us achieving that and then that having to happen in March. So from there, it's an interesting thing about life too, how God will have it. From my graduation at that, in my graduate degree, I get hired at a Christian school for their preschool summer program. And it was there that I got to learn what it was like to feel completely drained <laughs> and exhausted <laughs> as I had the pre precious privilege of watching 14 three and four year olds. So I'm single and um, this was a whole new experience for me with having responsibility over these precious souls, beautiful. And if I had to describe that experience, I would say that it was exhilarating, it was exhausting, but it was also very entertaining. There was this one boy who, it was his first time, he was a three year old, he came to preschool and every morning he was clinging to his mom because it was just a whole new place with new people. And so we had to bring him in. And after a couple of weeks, he got used to me. I remember having all of them on the playground and he would come and he would call me Miss Valentooms. Miss Valentooms, Miss Valentooms, Miss Valentooms. So I would turn and we'll call his name Brian for the sake of the story. I said, yes, Brian. He said, um, 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 the bug, the bug went on me. The bug touched me. So I said, what bug, Brian, where? He goes, the bug, it touched me. It came, came on my face. I said, where, what bug? So I'm looking all over his body. He said, the bug touched me. I said, wait, are you talking about a fly? He goes, yeah, the bug, the fly touched my face. I said, okay. So the next time the bug comes, cause he's gonna come back, this is what you say, shoo, shoo. So your turn, Let's try. He goes, shoo. I said, okay, good, takes off. 30 seconds later, comes back. Miss Valentooms, Miss Valentooms. Yes, Brian. The bug came back, he touched me again. Oh, he did, and what did you say? Did you say shoe? He says, no, I go like this. <laughs> Good job, buddy. That's the way you solve problems. Good job. High five, go back to play. So super cute took my word and went on his way, believed it and lived it out. Another funny story, super cute, precious three-year-old girl. We'll call her Julia for the sake of the story. Julia needed help and assistance in the bathroom one day. So in we go and these bathrooms are super cute. They're miniature. They're exactly the size of the child. So after she finished her business on the toilet, we were cleaning up and this is how I flush the toilet because it's so low, I would have to bend down and push down the lever. I just, you know, gently, right? Because it's my height, so I'm tall, I'm big, so I just touch, down goes the stuff, and now it's one pump of soap, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, wash hands, pow. That afternoon, after nap time, we were lining up the kids, and in comes this little girl, did her business again, and right after her, I said, go wash your hands. I'm turning to grab the next child. This beautiful little girl <laughs> is balancing on one leg while holding the wall and trying to get her foot high enough to do what she saw me do just hours earlier. And that just touched my heart because children, they watch, they listen, and then they do. 
And I remember when the days were drawing near after the two months, the last week of school, I'm sitting there watching them on the playground. And it's so beautiful because they always want your attention. Miss Valentine, look at what I can do. <laughs> Good job, buddy. I like your core, you're balancing there. You keep it going. Miss Valentine, look what I can do. <laughs> Good job, you've got some great balance there. Keep going. It's everything, watch me, watch me, look what I can do. And as they began to play and I watched, I saw the innocence and the joy that they have in playing. And as I entered into their smiles and their joy, it was like the Lord impressed on me and I heard his voice. And he said, become like them. Become like them. Carefree, light, joyous. They forgot about the pain that they just had in their boo-boo two seconds ago. And now they're off enjoying life. And as I watched them and entered into their joy, I wonder if that's how Jesus felt when he looked at his disciples. You see, in Luke, he parallels this Matthew prayer with being also in his book, but it's right on the heels of when he sent out 72 of his followers and said, go and do, go and say what you have seen me say and see me do. Go proclaim the message, the kingdom is here. Go heal the sick. And when he sent them out, it says that he came back and they began to report to Jesus of the joy. And they said, God, even evil spirits and demons are submitted to us. And in their joy, Jesus says a curious thing. He says, don't rejoice about things like that. Yes, I have given you authority. And yes, that is true. But rejoice instead that your names are written in the book of life. What, would he, what was he saying? Focus instead that yes, authority and power here, that's nothing to me. I like what Pastor John said, what seems so big to us is not to God. And as they're rejoicing in this power and authority, he says, remember, the thing you want to really find your joy and inspiration is, is in the Father and in the eternity that you will spend with him. And then he says this curious thing. And what he says there is that he reveals what is the foundation of everything, like that worship song said, our freedom, salvation, foundation, our gracious king. Jesus reveals everything in the foundation of this life and the next. Here it is, relationship, yeah. relationship. The Father has given me all things, and no one really knows me except him. No one really knows him except me, and he's given me the authority to reveal that that mystery, that power, that truth to whoever I want. Amen. And David Guzik calls this moment where Jesus reveals this, that he is the authorized revealer. God has given him the power to say, I trust you, and whoever you want to tell about me and show them who I am, you have that authority and power. Amen. And so Jesus and the Father, as he reveals to us, their relationship is super tight. They're solid. And Jesus invites us into that. From his fullness and his grace, he now turns and issues the invitation. And Matthew is the only one who records it. The invitation is an invite to enter into a deeper knowing and connection with him. So now for the first time in the story of God's word, we have 72 ordinary non-seminary citizens, everyday people who are doing all these supernatural works and they're proclaiming a message that comes with power and authority. And who does he give this invitation to? Who does he say to come? It's to the ones he sent out. But this wouldn't have been the first time that they heard the invitation and the word come. Because it's what Matthew heard in Matthew chapter 9 when he was sitting at his job at just another ordinary and routine day working at his booth when Jesus passed by, stopped, looked him in the eye and said, come, follow me. It's what the brothers John and James heard when they were fixing their nets for their father's business. It's what the brothers Andrew and Peter heard when they were actually working and mending their nets. And it's what Nathaniel's friend Philip heard when Philip brought his friend and said, 
this is Jesus, the one we were waiting for. Jesus turns to him and invites him to come. Charles Spurgeon, famed European pastor, says that he thinks that come was Jesus' favorite word. And I think, just my own opinion, that it's the Father's one too. You see, we read how he interacts with each generation of his people, and the message is always the same. Come, come back to me, draw near, repent. Repent is to turn from that road of destruction and death that you're walking down, that you don't even see is going to be your, your downfall. Come back to me. Come, come to me. When I think about even the Garden of Eden, and I think about his creation, and how on the seventh day it said that he rested, and in that rest he sat back and looked at everything that he made and said it was good. When you read along, what's the first question he asks in all of Genesis? The very first question. It happens on the heels of when Adam and Eve made their choice. And the question comes out in Genesis 3 where are you? And the question comes not because he can't see them hiding behind the tree. The question comes not because he doesn't know the answer, but he wants to reveal that now in this perfect order, there is separation. And he has been going and he started the initiation of the process that would try to bring us back. Come. He's been saying it from the beginning. He says it today. It's the beautiful duet of the bride and the spirit that they say, come. So come is the word. Where? To him. Come to me, all of you who are tired, who are weary, who are heavy laden, loaded down with the burdens of this life, of tradition, of religion, of rituals, and behavior modifications, and rules for how to connect with God. Come to me. Yeah. And I will give you rest. And in this rest, you have signed up for something. There is a process, and this is how it goes. You're gonna take my yoke, you're gonna put it on you, you're gonna take it, you're gonna receive it. You're gonna learn from me, and this is how I am. Yes, I am all powerful. Yes, I am the authorized revealer, but I am also gentle and humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And here we see that he is not negating that this life will not have burdens. It's very clear, come to you who have it. When you look at the original language of burden, it's this crushing weight that is meant to keep you down. And that is what we go through in life, through the busyness, through the trials, through the suffering, through the assignment, we go through these burdens. And Jesus is the one who says, come, you there, come to me. I see what you have. I want to take it, but you got to come. You accept the invitation. I won't force you, but I stand here and I ask, will you come? Come to me, he says. And in this coming, in this relationship, you will find rest Rest for your soul. What's your soul? Your will, your affections, your feelings. Everything that you're feeling from this life and what life brings, I'm going to give you rest in that. In that. Whenever he talks about the yoke, the, the people from Matthew's audience would have known what this was because this was an agricultural society and they knew about oxen. And the yoke was that tool that would make it, it would be fitted for two animals. The first animal would be the older one the experienced one, the strong one. They would fit that yoke on that animal and then they would find a younger one, a weaker one, and one that needed to be trained in what to do. They would yoke that onto that younger, smaller animal and it was then when they would walk through the fields that this younger one would learn how to follow the pace of the older. And Jesus is using that common knowledge to tell his people that's how it looks like in my kingdom. You want relief, you want escape, you want joy in the midst of this, you want a solution, it's me. And as you yoke and allow myself to lead you, you will find it. It's a well-fitting 
a well-fitting yoke. When he says easy, it's actually, it was perfectly fitted for that animal. The perfect fit. What is this process that Jesus calls us to yoke ourselves with, with him? It's called discipleship. Discipleship. That we would learn how to walk where he walks and that we would learn how to walk in the pace that he sets and that we would know that in him, we are perfectly fitted. This relationship with God and our life is fitted for you and you and you. Custom made for you. Even when you think your life is out of control, random things are happening, you don't understand. The perfect fit is that God, who is sovereign, is the one who controls your every step. Blessed are the steps of the righteous, for they are ordained by him. And as we learn how to walk, and as we learn how to live, we will see life very, very differently. Because Jesus promises that even as we walk through the life, we have the solution, even as we go through the struggle. What's the solution? It's him. And he is with us in it, with us in it. This relationship, he offers everything that he is. It's eternal. Listen to the language, who he is, what I have, my yoke, my father, my burden, I give it to you. It's free for you, but it cost me everything. Everything. So please come, please come and know who I am And in that revelation, you will know who you are. Eugene Peterson says it like this. Are you tired? Worn out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's beautiful unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And as we learn and as we grow and as we get into his pace, his stride, his rhythm, his leading, his guidance, then we learn and we experience the true meaning of joy. We will learn the ways and the leadership of God and how very different it looks from what we're used to here on earth. You see, in this yoke, and this is what I've been learning, 42 years old, still growing, still learning, but the more that I know of him, the more I can see that in this discipleship process, he's breaking self-reliance. Self-reliance in me, my strengths, my abilities, what I can do, all of that with him, broken. And that's part of the process of discipleship. The Bible calls it transformation. That we would look not more and more like us, but that in us, we would look more and more like him from glory to glory, from strength to strength. It is Jesus in us that shines brighter the more we break. So come to me, he teaches. And it's funny because as I think about how I'm trying to, as a teacher, grow my students to become their own person, to think on their own in the spiritual realm, it's actually quite different. See, we're always telling everybody, grow up, be independent, be who you're supposed to be. But in God's kingdom, he says, you want to you wanna become who you're supposed to be? Grow closer to me. Grow closer to me. Because the more closer you grow to me, the more you will grow up the more you will grow up. And the more dependent you become on me, the more mature you become. Maturity is fought and wrought through suffering. It's the hardships of this life that transform us. So if the transformation process is part of the discipleship process, then what's the lesson? Well, here's what I'm learning. Trust. Trust. What's the why for me? Trust. That I would trust him in everything. The situation may look different. The challenge may be different. But the lesson is the same. 
that I would continue to let go and trust that he who orders my steps is fitting my life exactly where I need to be, in front of who I need to be, so that he can shine bright. Trust in the Lord, my life verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord, not in my heart, not in my feelings, not in other people, not in this life. Trust in one thing. You trust in the Lord with all that you got, everything inside. Lean not on your own understanding, on what you think is right, on your experience in things, on what your theology is with God. Don't lean on that. Lean not on your own understanding. Instead, in all of your ways, acknowledge that he is the one that's leading you. And here it is. And he will direct your path. Amen. Him. He's the strong one. He's the one we're yoked to. And he's the one that's leading as we follow him. And as I learn this and as I see it, I think that Paul also saw the same thing. In 2 Corinthians, this letter that he writes, it's actually the second or third letter that he writes to this faith community in Corinth. And in this letter, you can see that it is his most vulnerable letter of all the 13 that he wrote. Because in this letter, he is very transparent to the people of God about the things that he's had to go through in his assignment. He understood that his life was perfectly fitted for a cause. That calling was an assignment from God, and that was to go where God said to go. It was to stay where God said to stay. It was to move when God said to move. And when Paul talks about this to the community of faith in 2 Corinthians 4, he says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Let me stop right there. Clay was a very common container that they would have had back in those days. And actually, when it broke, it was worthless. It was dumped in the trash. Glass, when it broke, could be burnt down, melted, and used for something else as another vessel. But clay, when that thing was broken, pow, no can use, so they had to throw it away. He says, we have this treasure. Treasure, if you look at the verses before, he's talking about the good news of Jesus. He's talking about the presence of Jesus in us. That's the treasure that we have. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Here it is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Then he goes on to say, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. He says, I believe, therefore I speak. This is my truth. Even though life is giving me a hard hand to deal with, this is what I believe. And then he says this in verse 16. So we, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, that's temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What is he saying? That even in the hardships of life, I can have joy? That even when I'm crushed in every way, I'm not, even though I'm afflicted in every way, I'm not crushed. Even when I'm perplexed, I don't understand, God, why are you doing this? Why is it now, Lord? Why is it this way? Even though I don't understand, I'm not driven to despair. Even though I'm persecuted by the church, by everyone who doesn't believe from demons themselves, even though I'm persecuted, I'm not forsaken. I'm struck down where he was many times, even left for dead in 2 Corinthians. 
It says that they stoned him violently. He was down on the ground, pretended to be dead. The believers gathered around. He gets back up, and guess where he goes? Right back into the same city that he just got driven out from. Who's setting the pace of this man's life? I want to know. And Paul goes, yep, I may have gone through all of this, but you know what? You know what? You know what? It's producing in me something that can't be seen. And he calls it a light momentary affliction. Light. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The commands of God are not burdensome. They are light. And when we look at the things of this world in comparison to eternity, ah, very different perspective on what that means. That though we're going through the hardships, it's producing in us something that cannot be taken away. Cannot. This truth of the hardships of life and how God uses it is very true in my own experience. The hardest trial that I've had to face up to date, and I'll close here, was the day that my mom passed away. Some of you knew her. She was a woman of faith, loved the Lord with all her heart, and lived that love through 12 years of kidney dialysis treatments, through a failed kidney transplant, and then going back on to dialysis after that. And it was such a rocky road and such a roller coaster ride of those 12 years. I was 14 years old when we got the news. And when she passed, I was 26. So a lot of my formative years were spent by her side, watching her suffer and go through tremendous physical hardship. She died three times and came back to life. Christmases spent in the hospital. All of it now is a blur, but some moments are poignant. So when that day came that I went back to work after two weeks of staying in the hospital, Okahi, my brother, calls me on the phone and says, Mom just went into a coma. I worked downtown at the time, and she was at St. Francis. So I ran, because I took the bus that morning, ran up to St. Francis. And there the doctor said that she's been in a coma for an hour, and it doesn't look good, and they're getting ready to pull the plug. You see, I've been there before, though. So it was just another thing because three times that had happened already in those 12 years. So it was just another moment. But I was tired. I was tired. And I couldn't lead anymore. So her sister, my auntie, gathered us around and we prayed. And then 20 minutes later, they said her heart stopped. And she was gone. Now I don't remember much of what happened that was in the morning. In the afternoon, my auntie who worked at the cemetery, she allowed me to watch them wheel her into where they were going to cremate her. And as I watched her, as she was sitting up, she had the most peaceful smile on her face. And it actually looked like she was sleeping. And it was a very different look from the past 12 years that I had seen. But as I watched her going in, I went home and we lived in Kaniohi at the time at Haiku Gardens. And I remember not even knowing how to feel because of the finality of that moment. So I put on my shoes, I walked out of my home and I went around my walking route, went to Kaniohi District Park. It was about 5, 5.30 in the afternoon. The sun was just about getting down. The teams were closing up getting ready to leave, soccer teams, baseball, tennis, it was all there. I just started mindlessly and randomly just walking the field. And as I looked, after how long, I don't know, I saw that the field was completely empty. So I walk to the middle, and I sit right in the middle of the field, and I look up at the Ko'olau Mountains. And as I'm watching the sun get lower and lower and lower, in a numb state of not even knowing how to feel, 
but just taking in what my eyes see, I heard the gentle whisper of God. And that voice said, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. And as the words began to drift over me, there was such a moment of a tangible presence of God that I felt like he was standing right next to me. And in that moment, I broke and I wept that my mom was gone. But simultaneously in my grief, I experienced the very real peace of God right there with me. Is it possible to have joy and peace in hardship and death? Yes. Nothing is impossible with God. With God. And he's the one church that we follow. He's the one that leads. He's the one that allows us to go through what is perfectly fitted for us in this life so that he can be the one to show us more of him. And in that showing, the more that you see him, the more that you more know him, the more that you taste of his goodness, the more you're going to want. He never disappoints. He never lets down. He is always faithful, always true, always good. So here's the word. Be encouraged, church. Be encouraged that though your life may seem dark, though your challenge may seem hard, though what you're going through may seem like it's more than you can bear, it probably is. And he's breaking off your strength so that you can lean in on him and allow him to set the pace of your life. And in that, you will receive joy and peace that the world and all the blows of the world cannot take away. Cannot. That's him. That's him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder in moments like this of how real and how good you are. And we thank you for the unbroken communion that you share with the Father and that you, the Son, give to us, that we will also experience what true fellowship looks like. We thank you for the experiences, God. I, I kind of understand now what Paul was saying when he says rejoice always, even when he's in there in the darkness of the prison, that he can rejoice in that affliction and that hardship. We thank you that our lives are perfectly fitted by you, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so, God, the best that we know how we as your church, we come before you and we place to you an offering of our lives. And we say, have your way. Have your way. As you bid us to come close, I pray for your people that you would give them the courage to step closer to you and that they will know that that is the answer that you have provided the solution already to every problem, every hindrance, every situation. It's in your hands. You're leading us through, and so we trust you. Thank you for the process. And so we ask, God, that as we leave, that you would continue to encourage us in our spirits, that we would be renewed day by day in you until we see you face to face. Thank you for the reminder that our time is short that it is limited so that you want us to make the most of it and to go about your father's business. So lead us, guide us, mold us and shape us however you want so that you will be glorified and we in turn will be able to enter into that beautiful joy that is ours. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Amen.